Yo, what's good YouTube? Back for another video. So, we're gonna do something a little new. I have decided to try to establish myself as a commentator on this particular subject. Electric cars, the future of cars, and things of that nature. I feel like I have some things that I can bring to the discussion and actions that we need to take as humanity progresses into the future. There are some new electric trucks that uh, have come to market. If you guys don't know about these electric trucks, Go ahead and look up these electric trucks. I'm talking about the Atlas XT and the Rivian RT1. Other people have done the basic introduction of the trucks. I'm gonna get in depth detail beyond that of what the consumers generally know about. Bring to light some things that the companies don't really tell you. Sorry, I just ate. Today's actually my birthday. Family went out. Anyways, electric cars are just cars, okay? I don't think we should try to make everything about the fuel that they use. They're just cars. Now, that's important. I think that people see the money that you'll be saving in annual fuel bills as more incentive to get a more direct return on their investment, but that's like more for commercial and business. That's really where that belongs. This is a car. It already has a purpose. I don't think as much emphasis is the thing when you're buying a gasoline car. They don't talk about that. Just because we want to save money when we buy a car doesn't mean that it has to be all about that either. Not that you should never buy a car for that purpose. Obviously businesses do. You should just look at that money as just good money that you save. And I think that's what's key to having the right mentality towards building the right finances to get out of the loop. In this case, it's purchasing an electric vehicle, which will have a large initial cost. I mean, that's just the reality of it. If you were to just cut through all the bull, even if it was like 20K to get a new electric car, it's not an attractive number that people are willing to just pay outright for. In the United States, that's not an attractive price tag to pay outright. And obviously these cars are costing several times that much. That's the right mentality that you need to have to build the right finances to get out of anything. It's not just about the car, but it starts there. It's a car, not a business proposition. That's why engineers need to make the cars that we drive just that good. So that even if they are paying for themselves, it doesn't matter, it's not about that. Okay, another thing, right? I think it's odd that they're trying to give them, especially with the Rivian, they're trying to give it a very luxurious feel to it and put a lot of premium features in it. Almost as if to like to get your mind off of the fact that electric cars as a whole have not made gasoline or combustion engines obsolete. I don't like looking at a good interior with all these great features, knowing that the basis, the platform that it's on is not a good foundation. You're asking for problems with this foundation, at least how it is right now. Like it has not done what's necessary to gain the title of being the next evolution. As they say, you know, the electric revolution, right? If it did all the things that was necessary, to gain that kind of respect and sure but i don't think it's there yet now here's the thing right electric cars are not the evolution of cars in general as i thought that they would be and should be instead they're they're like becoming this sort of solution to the gas crisis i was wondering about the motivation like what's driving these people to do this me looking at it from an engineering perspective these cars are clearly not ready i mean i'm just saying like they're not the revolution like oh it's not that gas cars are bad it's that the gas like i said i think they should be the evolution using electricity i like the idea of using electricity and the things that it brings to the table it's like the the urgency how they're pushing for it it doesn't make sense so I was wondering about the motivation, like it's more like they're becoming the solution to like this gas crisis issue. I heard at you know some point that somebody was saying like we're running out of oil or you know something like that, but that's not really the case. The case is that the oil deposits in the ground are running low, but th those are just the ones that they're using. If they go looking for other oil deposits, which there are, that costs money. That's the reason why gas prices are, are going up. So electric cars kind of circumvent that issue. Like electricity is cheaper to use as fuel to drive your car with than gas, but electric vehicles still have a lot of problems phasing out combustion engines. With that said, let's get some things straightened out here. I think the Rivian is a really dope vehicle, but it's Achilles heel to me seems to be its charge time. And like I said, you can go ahead and look at those those numbers i'm not gonna get into those only if it has something to do with what i'm saying it's almost the perfect vehicle for it meant for it's a lot more well-rounded than the atlas they actually have a uh a working prototype pre-production model the rt1 is like a colorado sized unibody crossover pickup truck built on a semi body on frame skateboard platform the platform it shares with a honda pilot like suv counterpart now the rt1 has a lot more well-polished 
amenities and things than an Atlas XT. Yeah, the Atlas XT is a, a lot more of a bare bones build, but they were really built for different things. It's not like just because the Rivian is a lot more well polished that you would automatically go for it. So that's why, you know, comparing these two is important. The Atlas XT is also built on the same skateboard platform called the XT platform. It's more of a commercial thing than it is a consumer thing, or at least in my eyes I think it is. But it's really meant to do both. The Atlas XT has a fully boxed frame. It has a separate bed. Either the cab or the bed can be switched out for something different, and that's all on top of the XT platform. It has supposedly a lot of room because it doesn't have the training tunnel. Both builds don't have the training tunnel. That's something that we've heard from Tesla, e-tron, the iPace, you know, other electric vehicles. At the same time, they kind of still put a console in there. I don't really think they're using the space the best way. It's just something that they advertise. They, they all always advertise the same thing. Whenever they come out with a Model X copy or whatever, we get all the torque at zero RPM and we have a flat floor because we don't have a training tunnel. You're always gonna hear the same thing. It's like, an audit, we're, we're gonna get the best torque vectoring because we've got motors on it, each axle. The Atlas XT is also similarly sized to a uh, Ford F-150 Raptor, I would say, Cause especially because of the long travel suspension that they wanna market so much. They also say it's gonna come in like a 2500 and 3500 models. So that's something that you're not seeing from Rivian. The Rivian has some interesting features with like the uh, cargo tunnel thing. I think people might look at something like that like just because of how they did it, how it looks differently, and they might think, oh, that's definitely revolutionary or something like that. But that specific space, if you know pickup trucks well, you know exactly where you can find that kind of space. It's either in the cab, underneath the, the bench seat, or it's in the, in, in the bed box. And because it's a smaller truck, it might not actually have more room in that kind of space on a pickup truck you might actually find more space just having it in the bed box. They both have franks. That's something that I think is more of a, a, a definite um, advantage. I have to give it that. But as far as like the air compressor and stuff like that, um, th th I feel like those are just some ap aftermarket things. I was doing the van build videos. I did mention that uh, one of the mods I wanted to do was ARB air compressor. So it's not to say that it's an aftermarket part that they just put on there, but that's exactly what, it, what I think it looks like. They try to do that to appeal to the working individual, but I mean, it's like, that's not really gonna help the truck sales. Uh, just because you have those features built in, I mean, that, that's, I mean, it's kind of silly. Both trucks have really good fast acceleration, good torque numbers, good towing capacity, but the Rivian is more of a Colorado Canyon size pickup truck. It's really hard to compare because they're, they're trying to act like just because they're revolutionizing the fuel thing means that they're revolutionizing the vehicles in general. It's not really compared to like a 1500 Silverado or 2500 or anything like that, so it's not, it has like this modern kind of minimalistic aesthetic. It's more of a stylish truck than like a rugged truck it can be rugged you know think of it more like a denali or like a king ranch than you think of it as like a, a z71 off road that or a raptor i would say the atlas you think more raptor when it comes to electric motors they're so different to combustion engines that it makes them incredibly hard to compare manufacturers will always tell you a certain amount of information but the rest of the information is too much for like the average person that's gonna buy the car. It's not just about a low torque at zero RPM. The horsepower and torque for, a, for an electric motor, even if it's equivalent, it's way different. The numbers are way different than how it is in, in a combustion engine. They have a lot less horsepower for the equivalent torque and a whole lot more torque for the equivalent horsepower. Um, just to give you a little a hint of what, what, what I'm talking about here. When I was doing the van build videos, one of the things I was saying for my van build, taking an old G20 build and putting an electric motor on it, I wanted to go with a DC electric motor. Now most uh, electric motors in, in most modern cars are AC motors. I wanted to go with a DC motor, it's just a very simple motor to use. No re regenerating brakes or anything like that. It's just a very simple motor. The motor I was looking at was a Warp, a warp 9, nine inch motor, 72 volts, right? That motor. We're talking about 30 horsepower, if that, over a hundred pound feet of torque. That's just like a makeshift multi-purpose motor. It's not optimized for anything. It's just multi-use. But you know, if you pair it with different kind of voltages and stuff, you can crank out different numbers. But by and large, in a 72 volt configuration, you get about 30 horsepower and a hundred pound feet of torque. And that would be enough to move a G20 van. That weighs 5,000 pounds. That now that's just a little smidgen of an example. So for systems that are optimized, sometimes you'll see manufacturers try to give you an idea of the performance of a motor if it were identical to the performance. Performance now, not numbers, not the actual figures, 
but just the performance. If the performance were similar to a combustion engine, like for instance, the Chevy Bolt, right? They claim 200 horsepower, 266 pound feet of torque. Coming from an engineering perspective, if I look at that, I'm thinking that that can't be right. I'm thinking a motor that produces 200 horsepower has got to have a whole lot more torque than that. But I would really have to think, what in the world are they trying to say here? Because this does not make any sense. For that torque, it would have had to have had a whole lot less horsepower. But really, what they're trying to tell you is that it feels like it's the same kind of performance that you would get if it were a 200 horsepower combustion engine in that car. That's where those numbers are really coming from. And that explains why you're seeing 750 horsepower coming out of the Rivian RT1 and 14,000 pound feet of torque. When the guy for Rivian was talking about the RT1, he was talking about the horsepower and torque. He said 750 horsepower, 750 horsepower. And I'm like, Wh which number is he talking about? Is he doing like one of those General Motor things or is he talking about electric horsepower? And I was thinking, dude, that's so overkill. Like you did not have to do that. For them to get 750 horsepower equivalent, they could have just went with General Motors numbers at 200. No, they decided to actually put 750 electric horsepower in there. I was thinking like, if it was really 750 horsepower, then the torque would be insane. The torque would be like over a thousand pound feet of torque. And I'm like, no, it had to be over 2000 pound feet of torque. And I'm like, nobody's gonna do that. But then he said 14,000 and I'm like, probably about 750. Oh gosh, that's ridiculous. But when I really started looking into the specs and the, the details about the Atlas XT, then I saw some of the goals that they wanted to do while they were thinking of making the project. One of the things they had listed was 600 horsepower and 12,000 pound feet of torque. And I was like, no way. So this, this is something that they're actually doing out here. Okay, they're doing. Now the thing is, these numbers don't really contribute that much to the vehicle's capabilities that much. This is just the kind of torque that comes with the territory when you're dealing with electric motors. It doesn't really make the vehicle like some kind of super strong, this, that, the other, no, not really. When you compare electric motors to uh, gasoline combustion engines or diesel, just combustion engines, or, or ice cars, as people like to say, internal combustion engines. The comparison is just so hard to do. The characteristics of each drivetrain, they each have something so unique. You gotta use whatever they bring to the table to do whatever you want, you know, maximize it. Too. Comparing it to, it's just, it's difficult, it's hard. Even with those insane numbers, the towing capacity on the Rivian isn't really all that crazy. It's, it's still less than, than um, a 1500 truck. It's the, it's the body, the body of the truck, the frame, the materials they're using, mostly aluminum. How strong is that? It's not like the big heavy steel on a Ford F-150 with class leading um, towing capacity and a whole lot less, you know, horsepower torque. And on top of that, I, I didn't even really want to say that. What I really wanted to say was electric motors are not good for towing. They're just not good for towing. The characteristics of the, of the drivetrain just make it, they get messed up real bad when it comes to hauling heavy weight. Now, when it comes to the Tesla truck, that's a totally different story. It's on a big heavy duty platform and that thing is completely optimized. I'm not sure even what it is. The, what I don't like about the Tesla truck is that I can't see its guts. So I don't know what they're doing to actually enable it to, to, to tow. The gap between the towing capacities of Tesla vehicles is like 4,000 pounds for the Model X. And then it's like 60 or 80,000 pounds for the, for the Tesla truck. I'm talking about the semi truck and the, the Model Y Model Y is not here yet, and we have no idea what, what kind of capability. What, I think it's absolutely hilarious that they waited till Rivian and Atlas have come forth with their stuff first. There's no doubt in my mind, based off of what these trucks are doing, that if they had a truck first, it would suck, and that they would, these these guys would kill them. Like I was saying, to get the horsepower and torque numbers up to where, or slightly higher than where they are in pickup trucks right now, 1500 pickup trucks that is right now. If it's not even pickup, 1500 pickup trucks is, is way lower. But uh, pickup trucks right now are hovering around 450, 500. To get those numbers in electric, all you need is like 200 horsepower. And that'll be like equivalent or slightly higher. But no, they decided to go 750. So you have all this excess torque and it's just like, you know, you need to take advantage of it. I mean, if you are, it's gonna be tough to really see how that's gonna work. So we know what the instantaneous torque um, performance is gonna bring to the table. We've seen what Tesla's already been able to do with the Model X people in R&D. We know how that, how that operates. On-road, off-road, towing a little bit. That much torque, I don't know, 14,000. That's more than a semi-truck. Last time I checked, it was probably like 06. I checked to see how much was the most torque in a semi-truck. It was some, 
a hardcore truck that Volvo made. It was up to three thousand pounds. The other day, some dude did a Duramax build. He put a really big aftermarket turbo on his Duramax build. He was cranking two thousand, and he was breaking axles because they couldn't handle the torque. It's not like it's gonna be breaking axles or anything. By no means, because it's fully electronic, so all of the torque is controlled. Which is another reason why the Model X will accelerate faster than sixty than a Dodge Demon or a Corvette Z01 or something. This is one of the advantages to the electric drivetrain. See, so you know it's a back and forth. You know? It's not. It's definitely not like oh, this is a clear win. These crazy numbers also explain why these trucks have such a fast zero to sixty. Because the Rivian RT1 is built like Jim C. Canyon or Chevrolet Col Colorado, if you could imagine a Ford Ranger with 600 to 750 horsepower. That would definitely get you to 60 in about three seconds or less now. Not to mention with towing, you know, if you're towing 5,000 pounds, 10,000 pounds, it's gonna be crazy fast acceleration for a truck. The same characteristic that we've been seeing from the Tesla just carrying right over into trucks. If you have the electric motor and it has equivalent performance numbers compared to gas, when it comes to heavy duty processes like towing, the combustion engine is just going to be a clear winner. It's just more durable. It can just handle a lot of heavy weight and pressure if you're talking about exhaust braking. That's something that electric motors are not really going to be doing. If anything, you're doing regenerative braking. I never thought of that comparing exhaust brake to regen. I don't see anybody else talking about that. I don't even know how you compare those two. But uh, as far as we know, combustion engines are where to go if you, if you want to tow something. And again, the thing with the Tesla truck is it's that's not a practical vehicle. It's a commercial vehicle. The expense is all, it's out there, you know? That's why I think the pickup truck is so important. People might say, oh, well, the capabilities are always obviously gonna be better on the, the Tesla truck. And I'm just like, that's not a pickup truck. It's not a practical vehicle that you can drive day to day. That's for commercials, that's for business is. Which, I mean, don't get me wrong, people have never actually said that. I'm just saying, I, I hope people don't. Like I was saying, the comparison between electric and combustion when it comes to towing, it's a difficult one to do. Partly because of the transmission, which is a give and take. A lot of times when you see the comparison between a combustion engine and an electric car nowadays, it's a subjective argument for the electric drivetrain being better. People need to do more objective comparisons. The transmission in a, in a combustion engine in comparison to electric is a give and take. Well, it's not even in comparison to electric. For instance, a lot of DIY builds will buy like a Warp 9 or a Warp 11, and they'll put that in place of their uh, engine which I'm not for, but like that's what people do, okay? People do this. Transmissions in general are not good for speed and efficiency. When it comes to towing, it's a lot more than just speed and efficiency. It has to do with the safety, the strength, the longevity, uh, the durability. It just has to do with things outside of speed and efficiency. Everything is, uh, cars is not about speed and efficiency, especially when it comes to pickup trucks, where that's not uh, so much of a concern. The concern is getting the job done. There's a few ways you can go about this for an electric motor. You could use the electric motor with the transmission and lose a whole bunch of efficiency and speed and things like that because of the inherent dynamics of using an electric motor. Or you can use a single speed gearbox with all that instantaneous torque and horsepower vectoring or variability for the most grip possible and just use extremely powerful motors that will in no way feel the burden of the weight that is placed on them. And that seems to be the solution that both Rivian and Atlas are approaching this with. And it's so funny too because that's something that I thought of from a long time ago. I was like, do you think maybe that's the case with mining trucks? If you compare a mining truck to a dump truck, What's the difference? It really bothered me when I was a little kid. I started like really looking at that from an engineering perspective. Damn, I could never stand this. Why are the wheels so big, but the dump is tiny in comparison to those wheels? Those trucks are huge. Why can't they put a bigger dump on there? You look at the dump trucks that you see on the road, they have really small wheels in comparison to how big the dump is. Never hit me until now. Mining trucks are also diesel electric, so yes, they are, they are using electric motors. But the diesel, first of all, the power source is almost sure. They're not using batteries or anything. It's like comparing a cordless drill to a quarter drill. A quarter drill is usually a whole lot more powerful. So the power source in, in general is more powerful. Then you have the uh, the motors. The motors are gigantic, they're huge. They're in the wheels, these giant hubs. What they're doing is they're scaling this thing so that the system is so powerful that it doesn't feel low. So even though they're using electric, it's like... Now the difference is when you use a gasoline setup, the gasoline engine can be tiny in comparison to the load, and it could even produce not even that much horsepower and torque. But the system is just so strong 
it can handle that. So that's the difference. The 14,000 pounds for your torque, and you're only getting 11,000 pounds torque capacity. Yeah, you could say, oh, it's a small little truck. It's made out of aluminum. It's not meant to be heavy duty and all this sort of stuff. You know, you could say that, but uh, I'm just saying, you know, that that's there. Atlas, on the other hand, they're trying to revolutionize towing in a pickup truck altogether. Yeah, you might look at the cab and all this sort of stuff on the Rivian. The capabilities, unlike anything we've ever seen before. I don't know how they're gonna do this. It seems like they're trying to maintain this state-of-the-art four-wheel drive system with four motors for each wheel, not in each wheel, because that's what we've kind of been seeing for a while, uh, like before the electric revolution was like a real thing. Volvo, they had a concept, they had wheel motors, but what we've seen, the difference between previous electric car evolution in today's like post 2006 tesla coming out with motors on the axles instead of the wheels i guess it was reliability issues the thing is can't forget why people wanted to do that because if you have the motors and the wheels and you got more space on the chassis for batteries and everything else you might even want to go there if motors became more durable or whatever so no not four motors in each wheel but two motors per axle and that's how they're doing it on the Atlas XT. That's how they're doing it on the Rivian too. It's kind of a copy of how they're doing it on the Tesla. The thing is they want to maintain that. It's a four wheel independent system with four wheel motors. There's no axles. There's no solid axles. Traditional trucks, they have solid axles. They want to maintain that and still tow up to 35,000 pounds with a dually model with double wheels in the back. 35,000 pounds, I feel like that's reasonable. That's decent, that's nice. We like that, but the highest towing capacity that I know of right now be in a 350 or in a 3500. That's coming from Dodge. They said, oh, we're gonna put air suspension on our trucks now. And then all of a sudden they're pulling 31,000 pounds. Nobody was, no one else was hitting that. But they're doing it on a solid axle. So I felt like it was kind of like almost deceitful to kind of say like, we're gonna hype you guys up with independent suspension, four wheel uh, motors. And, and then we're gonna say, we're gonna do a dually model. Independent suspension and four wheel motors, they, they kind of fit together, they make sense. Especially on a vehicle that you wanna have or like long travel suspension, for it to be a 1500, that makes sense. But then you slap a 35,000 on us and we're like, oh, that's definitely not gonna happen in the same truck. And only like really, you know, truck enthusiasts or whatever are gonna get this. We've never seen independent go that high. In tone capacity. The highest tone capacity I have seen on independent, the 2006 Hummer H1 Alpha with the 6.6 liter Duramax diesel engine, which because of the exhaust restrictions, they want to say that it was really the tuning. There's no dually that's independent. There's none. There is none. And I don't know if they're going to do it. It could just be a solid axle. But the thing is, you see what I'm saying, right? If it's a solid axle, is it still going to be independent wheel motors? Are they going to implement a different Suspension system that they didn't talk about. This actually touches on the Rivian Because Rivian is claiming over 11,000 pounds of capacity Independent as well unless something isn't right. They are literally claiming the highest independent towing capacity ever from an electric truck Okay, so you know people are all concerned if an electric truck can even be a truck here We are with this electric truck every other 1500 truck out there has a higher towing capacity. Yes, so you could say it's still not that trucky or whatever, but the, the key thing is that it's doing it with independent. That's what scares me. I don't think you people understand. Dooleys didn't always used to be able to do that. And this thing is doing this not only on a single wheel axle, but on independent. That's insane. And the thing is, I, I, I really thought that they made a typo from the build construction of the truck, the, the framing, material composition, drivetrain, everything. I didn't think it was possible for them to get that much towing capacity. The highest towing capacity I know of for that kind of suspension setup is coming from a Hummer. Like people know Hummers to be big, heavy duty, tough trucks. And I know them not to be particularly good for towing because of the, the independent suspension that they have. The Hummer H2 does not even out tow it and it's a newer vehicle, but it doesn't out tow it. I was wondering if people, maybe somebody had beat that. The closest thing that I found was the Dodge Durango which doesn't even really have fully independent. It has uh, multi-link, which is like independent, but it's weird. I just wonder like, how did, how did you guys get this much? Is it just because of the air springs? And, and, and this is an electric truck, you know what I'm saying? So how do you, how are you guys doing this? And that's my question. And I've asked people already, how are they doing this? I put multiple comments on the video. You want more comments, right? So here, here it is, I'm giving you all the comments and I'm asking an actual important question. Like, how are they doing this? This is a big deal. The other aspect of this is, right, I'm looking at this not as an electric car, I'm looking at it as a car in general. If you are bringing out a car in general, regardless of the fuel type, 
and it has this kind of capability, then let's go ahead and put that on all the other vehicles. Let's get gasoline engine vehicles, which are not obsolete. We've never seen independent suspension surpass 10,000 pounds of towing capacity. And you guys are telling us that you guys are doing it with this electric truck, regardless of the fact that it's electric. It looks like a Honda Ridgeline, but it outtows some 1,500 trucks. But then you got Atlas, who's trying to do this crazy thing. Not to say that it's impossible. Did he? 35,000 pounds of independent suspension? And it's been known, just in terms of trucks in general, that you don't use that kind of suspension if you want to tow. You look at Range Rovers, uh, Cayenne, th those things are doing 7,000 pounds of towing capacity. The only time I could find a truck doing something that high was if it was like, like a, a Land Cruiser. The newer Land Cruisers and some other Toyota models of it, a larger SUV, have switched to using independent for better riding and, and handling. Not not for towing capacity. Yeah, they're, they're bigger vehicles, they have more weight on the back because they're SUVs. But I just, I mean, it's, I, you know, it, just, it doesn't make sense. So all this kind of leads me to conclude that electric cars need to finish developing. I want to see what they can do, what they're going to bring to the table. I would love an electric revolution, but I don't think we're ready for it. How we say back home, I don't want no half do ting. I don't want a half done job. But electric cars have a lot of major flaws if they are to be the future of vehicles that we drive and phase out internal combustion engines. They still have a range issue, a towing issue, and they have refueling issues. Let, let's get things straightened out here. 400 miles range and 500 miles range, big 180 plus kilowatt hour. Talk about battery packs for a sec. Quick update, sorry guys. Uh, the furnace is uh, right behind me. I'm recording in my basement, so now you know. It's really cold and I can't turn off my furnace, so you're gonna hear this, that thing in the background. And I don't really have any noise, can noise cancellation. Enough. I just turn off the furnace. Anyways, like I was saying, a Nissan Leaf has a 40 kilowatt hour battery. I think when it came out in 2011, it had like a 20. Like I was saying with my build, my van build, I was thinking of doing a uh, range extender. It was going to be a hybrid and use that DC electric motor, but I wasn't going to get rid of the engine. I was thinking of taking half of a Nissan Leaf battery, easy battery to work with for any DIY person to do. Set that up in the back of the van, a bit different to most van builds, still being heavy duty platform. But that's the point why I'm bringing it up. There's 48 cells in there. I was going to take 20 cells. That all in all was 1280 in terms of amp hours. When you convert that to kilowatt hours, it's about 12. Double that basically. A Nissan Leaf. I was running 12 so I can get 72 volts to run it with the 72 volt uh, DC electric motor. I was not expecting great range or I was just expecting to be able to do it period and it would grant me some advantages being able to go back and forth certain places without using any gas. I do have the GoFundMe page for that if you guys are interested in that the link to it is in my uh, channel. Uh, hair thing. I think it's a dope interesting project. I don't think it's quite ready. I gotta make more videos on it. Just think it was interesting to mention because of how much battery it would it would have in it. About 12 kilowatt hours. A Nissan Leaf is slightly over double that at 20 and that was like the early model. I was at 40 something. That thing only gets 100 miles range. The average full electric vehicle gets around 300 miles range. We have to really objectively look at those numbers. Now, Rivian says that they want to come out with a vehicle giving us 400 miles range. What do you think when you hear 400 miles range for the last 10 years, gas cars? Not in terms of an electric car, but look at it as if it is just a car. That is pathetic range. 500 miles range, uh, that's a bit better. It's good for an electric car, but we're not looking at it from electric car perspective. You would have more incentive to look at it from an electric car perspective if there was a gas crisis, but it's not holistically and objectively better than a gas car. 400 range, 500 range, that's considered good for an electric car, but it's not good in general and certainly not good enough for the next generation of cars that we drive. If the gas guzzling 2012 Chevrolet Silverado 3500 HD is getting 660 miles to the tank and the fuel sipping 2012 Volkswagen Passat is getting 800 plus miles to the tank on diesel alone, then we've got a problem on our hands. Who does not want range of 1000 plus? The range itself, regardless of the fuel, we want more range. Tesla's talking about our infrastructure is sound. One station every 150 miles. If you're doing local travel, it should be within 150 miles or less of a station. I'm talking about the supercharged station. So of course there's a lot more charging stations. But if you're doing long distance travel, then you can fuel up at least 150 miles 
in any direction that you're heading. I think they say they're trying to get that number down a little bit more, but what they're saying is that their infrastructure is sound. And yeah, they're getting that off the power grid, which can be somewhat disappointing to some people because they, they want to be green or whatever. Did you honestly think it was coming from windmills and solar panels? I mean, even if it was coming from those sources, would, do you think it would be free? To me, it makes sense if power is coming from the grid and you just pay less or if it's coming from those other sources and you just pay less and you're paying for gas. But it seems like that's the goal that Tesla had in mind and that's the goal that all these electric companies had in mind. People just wanted to pay less for their fuel, not necessarily get free fuel, which I know that's crazy to some people to hear the term free fuel, but that's literally what I was shooting for. And that's something that I see feasible with my van build, having it be solar. And, you know, just the simplest idea that it can be charged in the sunlight, having the solar cells on the top, and then having an electric drivetrain, even if it's a DIY build with Nissan batteries and a warp nine motor. Not taken away from any of my heavy duty capabilities, you know, so that build is a pretty dope build that you guys can go ahead and check out and see how I, how I plan to do it. I don't see free fuel being a thing at all. To a lot of people, that sounds like you're cutting into capitalism, you're cutting off the economy. I don't see it that way. Capitalism can totally work just fine. It works a bit differently. People live a bit better, but it's not like it's just a hundred percent companies totally enslaving people. That's how I see it when we're talking about either gasoline or electric that's coming off of the grid. Just because I say free this, free that, the economy doesn't get shut down. So yeah, I was really shooting for a free fuel car. A thousand miles range, that's what I see for the future of cars. Then we have the issue of the refueling. Rivian, that's why I say that this is their Achilles heel. Their quickest charge time is off of supercharge and that's 20 minutes. Atlas wants to revolutionize the way electric vehicles today charge. They wanna go for that ultra charge, charge time of five minutes. They've achieved it on a smaller scale, and they say they're gonna scale it up, and they're gonna get the whole thing to charge that quick. Now, people might think that, you know, if that were the case, then Tesla would've done it or something like that. No, by far not. Batteries that are capable of charging so quickly and still performing pretty decently, the makeup of the battery could be even a, a hybrid of lithium and something else, or a solid state battery, which those are really sketchy. They're solid and they're like fragile. So that's why it's kind of iffy. We don't know what the chemical makeup of the Atlas XT's battery is gonna be like, but it's probably gonna be a lot more different than what you see in a Tesla. You can use a lot of different kind of interesting materials that are gonna give you different kinds of performance. Some materials will enable quicker charge time, but then they'll reduce the longevity of the battery and how many cycles it can be charged. And others will favor cycles and longevity and lifetime and reduce the charge time that can be attained. When you see a company claim that they're gonna have a one minute charge time, it's totally possible. It's just, you can go ahead and expect some other flaw or something coming along with that. Tesla's just looking at the longevity of the battery more than anything else. Their vehicles are topping out at 20 minute charge and that's only up to 80%. Rivian is, is looking at a 20 minute charge at up to 80% 80, 80 as well. And Atlas is looking at a four or five minute charge or seven minute charge, something like that. It's something like ridiculously quick and it's a 100% it's a charge. Yeah, and you know, you look at the Rivian and you might think, wow, this is a really luxury looking thing. And like I said, you know, that it's just, it almost is as if it's trying to distract you from the simple fact that they haven't really made a, a vehicle that's revolutionary and going to completely phase out what you drive right now. Atlas, they're not looking all luxury and stuff, but the capabilities, the 35,000 pounds tone capacity and the range of 500 miles and they're recharging this thing in one minute. 110 volts is basically going to give you anywhere from 30 to 8 hours charge. It's just, it takes forever. 30, it's sometimes it's 30, sometimes it's 16, and then it's eight, eight hours. It's up to 80% or something like that, 240 volts. That will get you uh, eight hours to four hours. Then you double that again to 440 volts, and that's the supercharge. 440 volts will take you from two hours to 20 minutes. And again, that's 20 minutes to 80%, and then two hours for the full charge. You double it again, 440 to 880, and that's the ultra charge rare, they're few and far between all over, you know. They're only done by certain companies, certain conglomerates or whatever. Used for charging experimental project batteries and stuff like that. Some companies will come out with a vehicle, but then they don't want to come out with a whole infrastructure to use it. Especially when it comes to like hydrogen vehicles. They want to make a car, but then they don't want to supply the hydrogen gas station. Some electric cars, like the I-Pace, that has no infrastructure just for it. Like, you know, I'm pretty sure no other car uses a station. 
they just use regular stations. And I don't know if the home if the home setup is actually any different to a, a, an electric station. But once you get to 880 volts, that will cut your charge time from 45 minutes to one minute. And the thing is, Teslas don't support it. The battery will probably explode or something, but that's where Atlas is really trying to work. And Nova System is trying to do that. So they would have to bring that infrastructure. And they say they're working with developers to, you know, in, you know power companies and whatever. And then we have the Mega Charge, which is doubling 880, probably looking at 1600. That has not really been invented yet, and it will probably kill you, but 45 minutes to one minute for that 80, especially if you got 500 miles range you probably don't have to worry about going to the mega charge that's basically how it goes for charging batteries you double the voltage and you cut the time in half you don't just keep going up in numbers you look for what's sufficient even if you don't really have a goal you have to at least find out what's sufficient I didn't really mean to make this like a bust or anything but I hate when people are sugarcoating them to seem like there's something all that great. Don't get me wrong, it can definitely work, but I wanna see dope cars out on the road. And right now, I'm not seeing them. I'm seeing all these half, all these half good cars. <laughs> one of the reasons why I want to go forward with that G20 build is the, a fundamental basis for doing other great things, you know, building up, up off of that platform that just has those principles on it. One resolution that I see really working for manufacturers producing something and not just me doing a DIY car mount is hybrid, like range extended, full EV hybrids. The only time I really don't like a hybrid car is when it's not a full EV mode type hybrid. When it, the electric motor only kicks in and it kicks back off after 30 miles per hour, or it just doesn't do anything for you. You'll see a lot of SUVs and crossovers that have a hybrid version that only gets about five more miles per gallon. Usually with vehicles below 40, below, below the $60,000 range. Past the $60,000 range, a hybrid vehicle will give you a full EV mode. Porsche Cayenne has a hybrid version. Uh, it's a very dope vehicle, full EV mode. It's a twin turbo thing, so it's like high performance. And that's the other thing too, it's like it gives you a full EV. It actually has decent performance in the EV mode small battery pack so it enables you to go back and forth like 20 miles here there anywhere and you can go full um hardcore motorist if you want to and then you combine the two and you get this crazy amount of performance i just love that it's beautiful and then you see the same thing but a different twist to it with the range rover eighty thousand dollar vehicle but it's beautiful one thing i didn't really touch on was the outlet aspect on the vehicle you know some some vehicles you'll find today with 150 watt 110 outlet on the vehicle which is a kind of a big deal but you see most vehicles combustion engine vehicles for some reason they're not worried about the battery a lot of things in a vehicle are running off of the battery and I read this article where it said that all manufacturers that produce combustion engine vehicles are gonna switch to using a 48 volt battery because the, the, the appliances in the cars themselves like I don't know the heat the air things are getting more power hungry so they're gonna switch to using more powerful battery. I don't know why they didn't just make that a regular thing like a long time ago. It's, you gotta understand a lot of the stuff was running off of the alternator. If the engine is off, your, your lights are going to kill the car. Your radio is gonna kill the car. It's within the assumption that if the car isn't moving, then you're not using it. It's, you know, so it's kind of S and I. Whereas with an electric vehicle, it doesn't matter if the car's moving. You still have full access to all of the power. And that really helps, especially when you have a pickup truck and it's parked and you have the tailgate down. It doesn't even make sense to have a combustion engine vehicle stationary and, 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 and on, like with the engine running and it not moving because you're using a lot of gas to produce a little bit of electricity off of that alternator that you're then using in the back out the tailgate with the tailgate outlet. I'm just saying, like it's a really simple fix, you know, just having ample power coming off of that, uh, coming off of the truck, especially in a van where, phew, I mean, things are just way different. I think that's just due to the engineers just not being very savvy, not trying. They just want that money. They want that money in hand. It's more of a capitalist mentality than it is a true engineering perspective. At the same time, if you want something more than what they give you, then you'll have to resort to car mods, which I've been always, I've always been about car mods. Just in terms of like engineering, people are doing a sloppy job, man. So yeah, the one solution I see really working for us right now is the hybrid car. It has to be that EV. That way we can get that 100 miles range and still use those supercharged stations. And similarly, any advantage that we have, that's why I think the towing capacity thing was such a big deal. Any development, any breakthrough that you guys are having, obviously you can just come right over to gasoline combustion setup. Independent suspension and all air suspension on this build, that, that really has nothing to do with what kind of fuel you're using. 
11,000 pound soccer bass mm -hmm. on a truck that has wholly independent suspension and that's something that we need to convert over to the Colorados right now and to the Ford Rangers right now because they suck and you guys are pulling this off. Now the one thing that had more to do with the Tonga Bassi being achievable on that setup, the superior drive setup of the electric, it's the best four wheel drive system ever made. The best uh, that we've seen from four wheel driving was from Audi and that was even that was very specific because it didn't have locking differentials. With a four wheel drive system, you don't have to worry about the differential. At the same time, such a setup is not going to be ideal for every scenario. For instance, towing, because you don't have the strength. More development has to be done. Going with a hybrid car doesn't stop or hinder the speed of the development for electric cars, if that's something that you guys still want to do. But I'm pretty sure if I tell you guys, screw hydrogen and screw full electric and go with a hybrid, it really does basically solve a lot of the issues. If you're getting 150 miles range and there's 150 miles between Phillips with a supercharge and you're doing this and you still have a combustion engine, it's really sucky though. It feels like a hybrid hard drive. I don't think it, it solves everything, but it solves so much that I think it will uh, really cut down a lot of people's interests in uh, electric cars and especially fuel cells because that is really stupid. I don't think that that's going to stop electric car development, but instead be precisely guided with a uh, purpose instead of rushing into it just for the money. That's the same flawed, pushy mentality that we've seen coming from Faraday Future 91. That's about it for the video. You guys know what to do. Comment, like, and subscribe. See you guys in the next one. I'm out.